In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The reading from the Synaxadion for July 21st, on which we commemorate our righteous father Simeon of Homs, full for Christ's sake, and his companion, John. On the 21st of the month, we celebrate the memory of our venerable father Simeon of Emesa, the fool for Christ, and John, his companion in Ascesis. Saints Simeon and John were from Syria, and lived during the reign of Justinian. John, at the age of twenty-two, had just married, and Simeon, two years older, only had his old mother for family. Finding a bond of friendship while on a pilgrimage to the holy places that they had undertaken for the feast of the exaltation of the cross, they decided to continue to travel together. When they arrived in the region of Jericho, John told his companion that the men who lived in the monasteries near the Jordan were like angels of God, and pointing towards the road that led there, he said, This is the road that leads to life. Then, indicating the great highway, he added, And this is the road that leads to death. After having prayed and drawn lots about the road they should take, they went to the monastery of St. Yanasimos with great joy, forgetting all that binds to the world. The abbot of the monastery, Blessed Nikon, had been given a revelation concerning the arrival of the two young men, and he met them at the door to welcome them and exhort them to renunciation, prophesying what would be their future way of life. At their request, Nikon tonsured them immediately and clothed them in the holy monastic habit, introducing them to a new life by a second baptism. Fearful, however, of losing the divine zeal that burned in their hearts and the resplendent glory that they had seen on the monastic habit, they decided two days later to leave the monastery and go apart from all men to live in the desert abandoned to providence. They directed their steps toward the Dead Sea and arrived in a part of the desert called Arnonas, where they found some buildings and supplies left by a hermit who had died a few days earlier. But as soon as they began their ascetic endeavors in solitude, they were assailed by the memory of their dear ones. John of his wife, and Simeon of his mother. Under pressure from these thoughts and the trials of sloth, Asidia, they were close to abandoning their struggle. But every time the memory of the effulgent glory that they had seen over the monastic habit and the appearing of their spiritual father in a dream gave them courage to persevere. They lived in cells a stone's throw from each other, and, when they were overwhelmed by temptation or sloth, they met to pray together. They then recounted their visions to each other and rejoiced to be delivered by God from preoccupation with their kinsfolk in order to persevere night and day in undistracted prayer. They thus made such progress that in a very few years they were counted worthy to be visited by God and receive the gift of working miracles. After spending thirty years in the desert, exposed to the rigors of the climate and the innumerable machinations of the devil, Simeon, who had attained blessed impassibility through the grace of the Holy Spirit who dwelt in him, suggested to his companion that he himself leave the desert in order to save others by exposing the foolishness of the world by the power of Christ. John, believing that Simeon was the victim of demonic delusion, admonished him and reminded him of the promise that they had both made never to be separated. But no argument could overcome Simeon's resolution, and, believing that his decision came from divine inspiration, John let him go after having made him promise that they would meet again before leaving this life. Simeon first made a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, whence, after having prayed for three days in the holy places, he left for Emesa, having decided to feign folly to carry out his ministry of salvation. He was thus the first to embrace this perilous ascesis of folly for Christ. Applying literally the words of the Apostle, If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. His whole purpose was to save souls, either through ridiculous behavior and calculated artifices, or by the miracles that he worked in offering himself to derision and contempt, or by the teaching and prophetic words that he spoke while feigning folly. In all this, he strove to remain hidden and unknown to men, in order to flee their praise and honor, living in the world as though in the desert. He made his entrance into the town, dragging, on a rope tied to his belt, a dead dog, which he had found on a pile of manure, and pursued by a mocking gang of schoolchildren. The next day, being a Sunday, he went into the church, and began to put out the candles, throwing nuts on the flames. When they tried to chase him out, he stepped onto the ambon, and bombarded the women with nuts. Finally thrown out, he overturned the tables of the pastry maker who beat him up. A fritter seller had pity on him and suggested to Simeon that he look after his booth. But Simeon, set to giving away his merchandise to passers by and greedily eating the fritters, as he had been fasting for a week, warned by his wife, the merchant belabored him and drove him away. That evening, Simeon took a bare handful of burning charcoal and lit incense on it. But, as soon as the merchant's wife saw him, he, pretending to be burned, put the embers in his coat. 
which also took no harm. Later on, he brought about the conversion of the merchant, who was a disciple of Severius of Antioch, by driving out a demon. Simeon then entered the service of a tavern keeper, who showed himself cruel and pitiless toward him, although the saint's buffoonery gave him more trade. One day, he punished Simeon harshly for having broken a pint jug of wine. But when he himself saw a snake had released its venom in the wine, he broke all the rest of the crockery in trying to kill the reptile. From that time, looked on as a saint by his patron, Simeon pretended to want to dishonor the merchant's wife, and the latter, alerted by his wife's cries, drove him away with blows. The man of God lived right in the town, impassable, and as though free of the cares of the flesh and the conventions of modesty, relieving himself in the street, going naked into the part of the public baths reserved for women, his clothes wrapped round his head, dancing with actresses whose hands he held, or playing with prostitutes, without feeling the slightest carnal stirring, and keeping his spirit imperturbably occupied with the work of God. He used this stratagem to make the acquaintance of loose women, and secretly promise them a large sum of money if they would keep chaste. When he learned that one of his friends had fallen back into luxury, he punished her either with a sickness or by allowing a demon to torment her. He had also received the grace of abstinence and spent the great fast without eating anything. When Great Thursday came though, he sat at a pastrymaker's stall and devoured cream cakes to the great scandal of the bigoted. On other occasions, after having spent the week in fasting, he ate meat in public. One day, he began throwing stones at some passers-by who were meaning to go down a haunted road, thus preserving them from perdition. Another time he afflicted some young girls who were jeering at him with a squint, and then healed some of them by kissing their eyes, but left the others in that state, as he saw that they would otherwise fall into debauchery. On Sundays, he stood at the church door eating sausages that he had wrapped round his shoulders like a deacon's stole, holding in his left hand a pot of mustard with which he painted the mouths of any who mocked at him. He healed a peasant who had been struck with blindness after stealing goats from his neighbor by coating his eyes with mustard. He once paralyzed the hand of a trickster by throwing a stone at him, and then healed him by appearing to him in a vision and making him promise to abandon his trade. Yet another time he began beating the pillars of the school with a whip, thus predicting the earthquake that would soon destroy the city of Antioch in the year 588. And, when the quake took place, the pillars that he had whipped remained standing. Before an epidemic of plague, he embraced all the children who were to become its victims, wishing them a good journey. He often went into the houses of the wealthy, practicing his usual buffoonery and pretending to embrace the women servants. One of them, having accused him of getting her with child, Simeon took care of the woman during her pregnancy, but she was unable to give birth until she had revealed the name of the real father. The holy fool's solicitude extended to everyone, especially the possessed, of whom he healed a great many by his prayer after having pretended to be like them. A Jewish artisan saw him one day, flanked by two angels. He wanted to reveal the saint's secret, but Simeon appeared to him in a dream and set a seal on his mouth. The same thing happened to all who discovered his virtue. They found themselves incapable of spreading it abroad. By means of all these prophetic acts, and public harangues in his simulation of folly, Saint Simeon, who always addressed and treated men as fools or mindless, denounced the crimes of some and the thefts and debauchery of others, thus bringing the habit of sin to an end through almost the whole town of Emissa. Possessing nothing in this world, he spent all his nights in prayer, in a dilapidated hut that he left each morning after having bathed the earth with tears for the salvation of his brethren. He then went into the town, his head crowned with an olive branch and holding a twig in his hand, dancing and crying out, Victory for the emperor and for the town. He signified, by these words, the victory acquired by the intellect and by his soul in the striving of prayer. God had also allowed his hair and beard not to grow during all his years in Emesa, so that he was deprived of the respect accorded to monks by their outward appearance. He only spoke rationally with a deacon called John, whose son he had saved from a false accusation of murder. At these times a delightful fragrance came from his mouth, but he threatened his interlocutor with terrible torments in the future life if he divulged his secret. When he had finished his course, two days before leaving this life, Simeon recounted his life to the deacon and revealed to him that, in fulfillment of the promise that they had made to each other, he had seen in a vision his companion John the ascetic, with a crown on his head, bearing the words, the crown of patience in the desert. And John had replied that he, Simeon, would wear the crown of all the souls he had saved by his buffoonery. After having exhorted the deacon to mercy, and never to approach the holy sanctuary with evil thoughts in his heart against anyone, he took leave of him. He retired to his hut, 
and, not wanting to become an object of wonder by his death, he slid under a pile of wood that always lay there, so that it would look as though he had been crushed to death. As those who knew him well had not seen him in the town for a couple of days, they went to his hut, and found him dead. Believing that he had been the victim of an accident, they did not even bother to wash the body, but buried him with neither candles nor hymns in the cemetery reserved for foreigners. When the cortege passed by the house of a Jewish glassblower, who had been converted by Simeon, the Jew heard such psalmody as had never been heard on earth, sung by a vast but invisible crowd. Stupefied he looked through the window, and saw just two men, carrying the remains of the man of God. He then cried out, Blessed are you, you fool! Because, deprived of the accompaniment of human psalmody, you have the heavenly powers honoring you with their hymns. And he went and buried him with his own hands. When Deacon John learned of the saint's death, he went to the cemetery and opened the grave. But he found it empty, and realized that the Lord had glorified his servant by taking him to glory in the body before the general resurrection. It was only thus that the people of Emesa understood that a new apostle had lived among them to bring about their salvation while remaining hidden. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, O Lord, Jesus Christ our God, have mercy on us, and save us.